Gotta go. Yeah, I'll call you back. I'm with that realtor. In every real estate transaction, something comes up that the buyer or seller may have a question about. But in the heat of the moment, the question goes unanswered. Each episode, I talk with real estate experts and real estate vendors to provide a look at what goes on behind the scenes in the real estate world to get you answers. I blend in local Santa Cruz history, add some tips and tricks, all designed to help you be successful in your next real estate project. Tell your friends you can't talk right now because you are with the Realtor Lady. Hello, this is Michelle Replogle, and you are with the Realtor Lady. Just a heads up, I have changed studios. I've talked about it. I'm down in my shed now in my backyard. So if the sound is a little bit different or the whole vibe seems a little different, it is. It's it's at home. Um, but I'm, I'm excited about it. I have more control over it, and I can have my guests on at, at more time so I can have more guests. So... Um, here we go. Today, I have Daniel Modell, and we are going to be talking about Santa Cruz East Side history. The East Side has, after talking to Daniel, I, I do believe this, the East Side does not get its due. We have uh, the West Side, we have Seabright, we even have Pleasure Point. I guess for the most part, Live Oak gets a lot of attention as well, but the East Side seems to not get as much attention in discussions or in the community, and we're going to talk about that. We're also going to go over historical monuments around the area, different areas of the East Side, and then we're going to talk a little bit about uh, Daniel's own home buying experience and what he feels about the house that he bought. Uh, he had some interesting ideas there, and I want to I want to hear about them because, after all, you are with the Realtor Lady. So, Daniel, welcome. Thank you. So, uh, I I have a starting at historical monuments. Maybe with that, you could kind of outline maybe what we think of as the East Side. Maybe some points of reference. Well, that's a really good place to start. You know, what is it that we're talking about? Uh, the East Side, uh, historically, has been more or less from uh, San Lorenzo River to the Yacht Harbor and, and Rana Gulch. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, is Seabright part of the East Side? Um, uh, I've talked to a lot of Seabright residents and they, they, they would, would concur. Um, but it gets blurred, especially over on 41st Avenue, where there's a number of restaurants that might call themselves the Eastside Eatery. Uh, you know, they are really uh, blurring that line considerably. Well, it's interesting because when I've, I've had listings in, in Seabright, people will come in to the, the open house and give me this very small little... Uh, pocket that they consider Seabright and they would not consider themselves part of the East side. So it's, it's one of those things, but well, for, the, and, for and, our and labels are so, uh, you know, uh, contentious, uh, when I purchased my house, you know, this area wasn't referred to as the East side. It was referred to as the banana belt. Yeah. Um, which... And but, you know, yeah. historically, you know, I, I've done a lot of work in East Side history and I've talked to a lot of long term residents and they really uh, feel strongly that the, the, the river to the harbor is the east side of Santa Cruz. And, you know, geographically, it is. I mean, part of the reason why it gets confusing to people is that the city and their ultimate wisdom hasn't put up any city limit signs that people can see. There's a tiny little one along SoCal that's way up on a, on a, on a, on a light pole that nobody notices. Um, and between that and the fact that I think it was in 1963, uh, Live Oak residents started getting Santa Cruz addresses uh, also further confused things. Well, what was their addresses before? Before 1963? You know, that's a really good question. Um, 
To be totally honest, I'm not quite sure, but basically in 1963, there was a lot of talk of the Live Oak area getting annexed by either Capitola or Santa Cruz. Uh, and it was at that point forward that they started getting Santa Cruz addresses. Yeah. I, I, Capitola would have been happy to eat it all up. They, 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 they grabbed them all. They, they wanted to get 38th, but they didn't quite get it. Um, okay. So, so what are some other monuments? So we have a tiny little city limit sign. What we, you and I talked about some, but, but, but we'd go back over those, some of the monuments around the area. There's some on Morrissey and the, uh, well, it, it's a quite, island. again, these, these terms are so, uh, you know, subjective, uh, to, you know, probably the, 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 only formal mon monument that I would say is on the east side is the one that I helped construct, uh, which is for the east side library, which is on the little triangle of land where Morrissey, Soquel, and Water Street intersect. Uh, and How long ago was the library there? The library was there from 1921 until 1967. Well, that's a long time. I didn't know it was there that long. Well, it was one of four Carnegie libraries that were built in the, you know, in the early 1900s. Uh, I think it was the last of the four. Um, the Garfield Park, downtown, mm -hmm. east downtown. side. But do you know, do you know the fourth one? Okay. The fourth one. It's not a library anymore, but it's still here. <gasps> no. It's the, the Natural History Museum in Seabright. Oh, I should know that. That was the Seabright Library. I follow so, them on Twitter. I think they mention it every once in a while. Uh, I, I wouldn't be surprised. I wouldn't be surprised. They certainly honor that element to their past. And a lot of Carnegie libraries around the country that have been repurposed have become uh, museums of one kind or another. Um, but, uh, you know, a, a lot of people can't imagine that there was a Carnegie Library on that tiny little plot of land. Actually, when I started my project, there were people who were referring to that property as a, a, a traffic island, which it kind of sort of is. I can understand <laughs> that, but that's a great way to depersonalize the space and turn it to an object as opposed to what actually had been uh, around 1909 or so, uh, El Portal Park. Uh, it was named that because back then it was at the, the, the portal, the entry point into Santa Cruz. So I got the, the marker for the library put up. I got the, the name returned to the park. It is actually a park again. And what's it called now? El Portal. Oh, it is called El Portal. Okay. Yes. Now. Okay. Um, but other, you know, historical markers uh, along Morrissey at Hammond and at Melrose on the east side of the road, there are uh, pillars uh, which go back, again, I can't get the dates quite right, to about, again, about 1908, 1909, uh, when the, what was then known as the La Viega Park Tract uh, was built, uh, which is the area to the uh, to the east of Morrissey and uh, up above and what is now Prospect Heights. That was the La Viega Park tract. So uh, on the one of the Facebook groups, the reminiscent uh, Facebook group, I can't remember the name of it right now, but uh, the topic of the zoo came up. And uh, yes. I don't know anything. There was a zoo up there uh, off Prospect Heights. Yes, right there below the was. park. Uh, the remains of the, the, the bear enclosure are still there with a, um, with a date marker at the bottom for 1919 when it was built. Uh, the, 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 fen the metal fencing is still there. Uh, I, I really would love to see a more form, formal marker placed up there. Problem is that a lot of these things can get vandalized. Yeah. Do you know how long the zoo was there? Uh, my guess off the top of my head would be maybe about 10 to 15 years. So uh, I've seen pictures of bears and buffalo. I mean, there's uh, newspaper reports of the, the, the bear getting loose. Um, <laughs> 
you know, uh, I think in the end, all the animals were either sold off and or I, I'm very sorry to say uh, what you'd say, you know, euthanized, uh, which is very sad. You know, zoos uh, are kind of an antiquated way of, of, of taking care of animals, especially the way that they were taken care of up there was not the best. Um, so, you know, the West Side was kind of a, a, a tourist lumber baron kind of uh, resource lime kiln and all that sort of stuff uh, area. And then you have Aptos, which was kind of this rich playboy area, almost a playboy. It's not the right word, but kind of where the rich kind of played. And then you have the, the ocean. What was the oh, oh, and I'm sorry, let me backtrack. Live Oak was also kind of the farmer section still. It was kind of the the there was orchards and and then we had the chicken ranches but what would you say the east side maybe even at the time of the zoo what what was that area for was it where yeah uh, mayors well, lived what what was that area kind of known for as it were well that's a very good question and, and certainly in part you know this area was 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 residential you know with with houses um but actually, before the chickens became king in, in Live Oak, they were here on the east side. Uh, there were, were chicken farms everywhere. Actually, over on, on Park Way, there was a chicken farm with uh, perhaps my favorite name. It was called Webb's Cackle Farm. Webb's Cackle Farm? Cackle Farm, the chicken sound, yes. Uh, so yeah, there were chicken. Basically, <laughs> at least it's my understanding that you know, as residential growth uh, hit the east side more, the 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 chicken business moved more to Live Oak. So as, as again, as far as I understand it, they were they were kind of here first. So chickens were definitely a, a, a big thing. Uh, flower growing uh, was a big thing as well. Uh, you know, you got to kind of think of the East Side as having at one time kind of been like Live Oak. Up until 1905, the East Side wasn't part of Santa Cruz. Uh, it was the town of Branson 40. So, Ooh, I didn't know that. Oh, yes. Uh, so, uh, uh, so once it got annexed, you had a whole lot of development going on, kind of again, like, you know, Live Oak is. Is, is, is got a lot of development. So, uh, so yes, it, it had been the town of Branson 40. Uh, the, the Villa de Branson 40 was a, a, a secular colony that the, the Spanish set up uh, right across the river from a mission, which was probably not one of their brighter ideas. There was a lot of acrimony between the mission and the, and the Branson 40 residents. <laughs> but, but yeah, so, I mean, it's always been a, a residential area, which again, is probably part of the reason why it doesn't get the press. Uh, you know, there's no big, big beaches. There's no, uh, you know, there's no big business. Probably one of the biggest and on the east side historically was Ebert's department store and supermarket, which ran from- Horst Schneider's nine, Rio. And yeah. Horst Schneider's, that's true. Um, but Ebert's was here from 1915 until 1998, so it saw a lot of the, the development of the east side. And a quick stint at a Harley store. Yes, well, the, yes, the Harley store was was there for a time. Now it's Lillian's Restaurant, which it, I should also mention is quite local. That is run by the Moreno family, who are my neighbors a few houses down from from where I live. So I sold them a uh, house. Yeah. <laughs> I told uh, the property is still owned by the Ebert family. Actually, I should mention, which is pretty neat. That's wow. Um, so before we leave El Porto, so originally at its inception, even before the library, was it just because of these large roads converging that created this island? How did that island get created? That's a good question. I, I can't really offer you. Uh, a definitive answer, but I can tell you that that you know was a, a an important intersection for for a number of years. There was actually uh, I, I know th they they're not very popular these days, but there was a mission bell actually in the park. Uh, the mission bells, you know, people associate with the missions. They were actually placed by early auto enthusiasts to encourage people to drive from one mission to the next. 
Uh, obviously, they, they are quite controversial now, but the fact that one was there shows to me just how important that intersection was. Yeah, yeah. Um, I do remember the fountain. I do remember the fountain being empty and people sitting in it. I remember. Yeah, it kind I should of also swing. mention about the fountain that the 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 wooden uh, poles that were in the fountain were actually old telegraph poles. Um, but yes, it, it, when the library uh, got demolished uh, in in '68, I believe uh, they put in a fountain for a time, but it did become a congregating point for the uh, for the homeless uh, who had harassed passersby, and eventually they they put an end to that. I was very appreciative that the city would allow that area to get redeveloped a bit and have the marker put in. Uh, I think it's it's worked very well. So you were going to talk a little bit about Arana Gulch. Well, for, you know, uh, Arana Gulch to me is one of the jewels of the East side. It is a, uh, a public space that really doesn't get a lot of, uh, a lot of press. Uh, it, is named for uh, Jose and Feliciana Arana, who uh, uh, first settled there, I believe, in about 1834 uh, and had their home there, farmed the property uh, uh, for, for a number of years. Uh, but also, while their home has since uh, gone uh, along the the western edge of the gulch is the Hagman House, which is still there today, uh, well hidden behind the trees and, and things. It's kind um, of like around the bin, isn't it? It's kind of behind the trees, and I think I've seen a, a little glimpse of it, but it's yes, really out Yes, most people do see glimpses. That home was built in 1871 by Frederick and Amelia Hagman. Wow. Uh, Hagman was a what he what would be termed a gentleman farmer. He was a uh, a, a rich man who uh, retired to having this farm, which, you know, wasn't a huge money maker, but it was a way to pass the time. Um, but in 1885, the uh, I wish I had a picture I could show you. The house was remodeled, and if you see it today, it really kind of has this gingerbread castle kind of look to it. It's very unique. Uh, I am very thankful that the owners. Uh, have been able to keep it all these years. It is on the national list of historic places. I, um, I just want to add in um, because there's so much controversy. This is a, a bit of a podcast about Santa Cruz is that we have to remember our past. And that's where a lot of rich people came here for, for over 200 years. We've had people coming to live here who have had a lot of money and there's absolutely. always this you know and there's always this well these people are coming in and it's like they've been coming in <laughs> yes it, it is certainly not a new thing we have a love-hate relationship with tourists and people coming from out of town but it's always such a delicate balance and Arana Gulch is really interesting because uh, I'll, I'll give you a little bit of a backstory in 1919 uh, the Kinsley family, uh, purchased a lot of the Arana Gulch property and had a dairy there, which was called the East Side Dairy, by the way. Um, uh, not the Midtown Dairy, sorry. <laughs> but um, <laughs> Nice one. Uh, the interesting thing is, is that the, the Kinsley family who are still here in Santa Cruz, they tried to develop that property uh, into a housing development. There was actually even talk at one time of turning it into a a parking lot for Twin Lakes Beach. Uh, and it was, uh, you know, the city started by saying they could do it. Then they changed their mind. Uh, it went to courts for a very long time. Eventually, the city purchased the property. And I honestly don't feel like the Iran, like the, the Kinsley family got a, a, a fair shake from the city. But I am super thankful that that property was saved and protected. Uh, recently, uh, paths were put through there. An area was blocked off uh, for uh, for cattle grazing, which I actually really like because there used to be a dairy there. It's a little historical uh, nod. 
Um, but, uh, you know, a lot of people wanted that area to stay more wild. So I understand that, but I'm just thankful that it's there and hasn't been turned into, you know, condos. Absolutely. I think the appreciation for that area, though, has really grown. And I, the people that are using it when I'm there um, seem to be really grateful for it. And it's always refreshing to be in a, a public space that people uh, take care of it and and understand the, the 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 value of it. And so the way it was developed probably upset a lot of people. But you, I always tell people in, in our area, especially, you really can't have it both ways. You have to kind of figure out how to meet in the middle. We're we're very limited. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And there are still little paths and ways to to go down by the Arana Creek or to the overlook of the harbor. There are ways to get a little bit more distance from, from civilization there too. Uh, so yeah, no, it's, it's, it's been welcomed by a lot of people. It's a very popular uh, location. Um, yeah, I, I, I've only been in it a couple times, which is funny because when I was a kid, I was in it all the time because we, that's how we got, a, we got across town going through there. Mm -hmm. I can't remember how we actually did it. I don't think the paths were very well carved, but it was. Well, no, they we never, they cars. never were. And, you know, and at one point, part of the, the development idea was to connect Broadway to Bromer and to actually put like an elevated roadway through the gulch, uh, which I can't imagine them doing now. It's so nice. And, you know, and the, the green belts in Santa Cruz are so, so few and far between. There's little neighborhood parks and things, but uh, we are very appreciative to have that area. And it's a, it's a, a gateway for us to, to, to get to the harbor too, uh, which is a wonderful uh, place. Um, so let's, I guess, jump right in. Uh, Midtown versus Eastside. You know, this has been playing out in the newspaper. I don't know if you've seen some letters to the Sentinel about it. Very timely. Oh, a absolutely. And I, uh, uh, I, I uh, especially appreciate one recently from Larry Dunham. Larry's a long-term, uh, dare I say, Seabright <laughs> resident, but even he uh, recognizes that, that this is all the, the East Side and wants to keep that name. But, uh, you know, the thing is, you know, uh, I've talked to, to many longtime residents, all who are very passionate about the, the, the East Side name. And uh, it is very hard for them to see, you know, Midtown put, you know, labels put up in businesses and the like. Uh, at the same time, as you say, looking for kind of that middle ground, you know, prior to 1905, you know, this area was, was Branza Uh, I'm sure there were a lot of people who, uh, did not like, you know, referring to their town by a, a new name. Uh, right. name changes are, are very hard on people. They get very attached. It's part of who they are. I mean, I hear stories of, uh, all the kids going down to the Del Mar. And if you were on the East side, you stayed on one side of the theater and the West side on the other. Uh, it's, you know, it's, it's part of who they are. Um, at the same time, uh, you know, the, there's never been an official designation, um, so it, it, it makes the, the naming process that much more fluid. I mean, don't get me wrong. I, I'm very, I, I, I very much like this area as the east side. I think that does need to become official. But until it does, you know, surfers were a lot of the group that liked uh, Midtown. Um, you know, the businesses like it because it gives them attention. You know, we're talking about this. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I feel the east side should be the, the east side. But as I mentioned before, no, no uh, city limits markers to, to speak of, um, you know, no real identifiers of this, this area uh, as the east side. It's, it's a challenge. I uh, just had the pleasure of hanging out with uh, Susan Brown, Willie Brown's daughter in San Francisco. And she does a podcast called uh, Behind the Fog. And the podcast is basically talking about how people move into an area and then have their kind of idea of that area and then kind of slap it over mm -hmm. that area. And then, you know, just driving the locals crazy because it's like, no, no, that's not us. You don't, 
understand us, why don't you get to know us a little bit before? So, you know, the Midtown adopters could be new or they could have been here a while, but it's still that, to me, that is just, did you even look into this a little bit and how that area was or get the vibe before you just decided it was Midtown? I don't know. Cause I, I well, I'm, I'm, I'm on the East. I, I guess if I'm going to take a side, I grew up the T side. Midtown sounds very no, uh, I understood. I mean, hipster I, I, to me. Hearing some of the, the, the stories in mean, the, the surfers, I would say probably, you know, had this as Midtown before just about anybody else did. And it makes sense. Probably for them, the, the Eastern edge would be pleasure point. Um, right. For their, for what they do. Um, but uh, what was I going to say? But people, well, uh, you know, um, one of the big things that I do is uh, my historical walking tours. I run three different walking tours each year. At least I was doing that before COVID. And it was a great experience to educate people on the history of the area uh, because there are so many things that they don't know. Uh, and once they start to learn, they take, you know, these things more seriously. It kind of becomes part of who they are. You know, how did your street get its name? Or who was the first person who lived in your house? Uh, my house was built in 1961. And I actually tracked down the uh, family who originally owned it. Their, their daughter, who grew up in this house, uh, lives in Tucson, Arizona. And she had photos of my house being built. And, to, you know, to see those things, I, I, I'm so much more attached to uh, my property and to my neighborhood. Uh, you know, one of, the, um, uh, one of the positive byproducts of the pandemic is all the people that get out and walk. You know, when you drive to work and you're at work and then you drive home, you, you know, you go in your door and you're in your house, you're not as connected to your, your neighborhood and where you live. Uh, the pandemic has allowed people to, you know, venture out in their communities, and uh, I would hope feel more connected as a result. Yeah, I, I think it's it's really good to learn about the historical tours are are amazing. I'm glad you do those, and hope that you uh, resume those. Those are so much fun. You just get to learn so much about, and I think that's going back to what people don't know about Santa Cruz is layer upon layer. There's just so much amazing stuff that's happened here. And it just seems like this goofy little beach town when there's just really so much to it, really more than people the, understand. Uh, the, the first time I ran my Rana Gulch tour, I had over a hundred people come. Oh my goodness. I went on one downtown. We did a walking tour of downtown. It was an earthquake anniversary tour. There was like a hundred people. We could barely get you know, you're just like racing to get up to the, I can't remember who the, he's well known, trying to get up uh, close Ross to Gibson, him. Perhaps? I, it might have been Ross Gibson, but um, it, it was just, it was just hard to follow. And I was there. I mean, I was, I was there for the whole, all of it. I was just kind of looking to learn more that I, I didn't know. Uh, but those, those large tours are tough, but so well so fun you know what i like about the tours that i do is that i talk about you know how the the, the streets in the area got their name uh again people feel so much more attached to their 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 neighborhood when they they understand the the names of the uh, the streets uh one of the things i know you had wanted to touch on uh, Hammond Avenue, which is uh, which bisects Morrissey uh, here on the east side. Uh, one of the corners of that where it hits Pacheco Avenue, it says Grant Avenue on the, the, the street side, but it says Hammond on the street sign. And people always ask me about that. And it turns out that, you know, Hammond Avenue got named for Mayor of Santa Cruz, who, uh, Roy Hammond, who died in office in 1938. Uh, so, you know, I, I love doing these tours because I help acquaint people with the neighborhood where they live. And there are such great stories. There are so many amazing people who have lived uh, in, in these neighborhoods with wonderful stories, you know, fellow 
you know, not always happy ones. A fellow uh, in my neighborhood wound up in a Japanese uh, internment camp in World War II. Uh, you know, they're important stories to understand. That Pacheco Avenue, one of the highest end streets in my neighborhood, uh, once had the city pound, uh, you know, along it. A uh, fellow by the name of Doc Graves ran it. Uh, you know, it's there, th these all these neighborhoods are so rich with history. Uh, I wish more people would research their homes, re research their streets. There's there's so much to learn. The older homes, I, I the older homes aren't too typically hard. I did follow a lot of uh, trails on my house, but it really stopped in the 30s. Uh, my house is built in 26, so I was able to follow it maybe 35. And then after that, but you know, a phone book back in the day or a, or a, a you know, a, a area book, whatever they were, they, they would give their full name, their occupation, their, ad I mean, like, oh my gosh, they're so crazy. They well, told uh, everything about the, the no, woman who lived in my house was like a nurse and it was her whole name and even told when she got married. But yeah, between phone books and old newspapers, there's an incredible amount of information out there. Uh, you know, it's not just the, the the internet where all of our data is. It's all in this, these past measures. And just to to uh, to let you know, the old phone book back in the day was called the Polk Directory. And for anybody who wants to learn about the history of their house, they have the Polk Directories going all the way back to about 1920 down at the downtown library here in Santa Cruz. They're missing uh, some years, though. They're not full. You've you've been you've been doing your research. Yes, yes, they have. Uh, I'm thankful that they do have what they have, though. I, they probably they really all need to get scanned because they are some of them are falling apart. But they are, and um, so they do take some work too. Don't expect that you would go and just look. So my street name wasn't always Van Ass. I can't remember the street name uh -huh. that it was, and the numbering system changes as well. So as houses get built. I think well, no, my, you're, you're, you're my address was some other crazy address. There was a big shift in addresses in the 1940s, uh, Santa Cruz wide. But that's actually one of the times when the Polk directories come in handy, not to get too detailed here. But if you have, if you, if you start going back and you, you know who the family was that owned the home, you know, once the, the, the numbers change, you just find the same family and odds are that's your house. So you can keep going back. But yes, it is harder. Right. Yeah. Most every street has had a, a number change over the years. Or an address change. And then uh, we've we've kind of hit on all the points. Uh, just following up, uh, finishing up, sorry. Uh, tell me a little bit about buying your house. You had an idea about owning a home and, and, uh, what it's like to live in a house that other people have lived in and, um, elaborate on that. Cause I thought that was kind of a cool idea. Well, uh, I, when I purchased this house, I was, you know, first time homeowner, uh, and I had all these grand ideas that, you know, I'm going to get this really new modern house and it's going to be my house. And I'm going to be, you know, really kind of creating the space as my own. And, uh, in the end, purchasing this house, you know, from 1961, I, I realized that, you know, it's not my house, you know, I, I may own it financially, but there were people here before me, there will be people here after me. I am part of a, of a line of people that have come through this home. Uh, and that was made that much stronger by tracking down the original owners, uh, you know, and I intend to share everything I've learned with the next people to own my to own my house because I, I think that uh, you know w as a as a country we think of home ownership as this is your house this is your space but we are all just you know time over time we are all just just transitory ghosts in the machine. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it's an important to have that kind of perspective because then you appreciate your house at a deeper level. Then you know maybe you're you're less likely to 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 blow it up and and remodel it because you sit there and you can appreciate. I know it's not for everyone, but you know the knob and tubing uh, that goes back you know a long time ago, or 
or just the uh, the the style of the house. You know, I live in a mid-century style home. Uh, you know, somebody could turn it into something different, but, you know, it would lose any continuity with the past once you, you try to turn a house into something that it wasn't designed for. Yeah, our our house was built in 26. It's um, it's original uh, box, as it were. It's typically it's just a box. It's an 800 square foot box. It's pretty much the same. Um, and we've changed the inside to be more comfortable but we've never really wanted to change it completely. We do appreciate it, but we also appreciate the neighborhood and the area that we are. So I think being a little less attached to the house, a little bit more attached to the neighborhood and the, and the area that you're in, you know, you get all inside your house and then that's just your world versus this whole rich area to enjoy. So, yeah. Well, I, 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 I realize it may not be the thing, for you, but uh, I do want to give a plug to the, the uh, museum's uh, blue plaque program. Uh, a lot of people feel that if you're going to get a historical blue plaque uh, from the museum put on your home, that somehow it carries some historical designation that, you know, you can't do to your house what you want to do. That is, that is totally wrong. Oh. Uh, it is purely decorative, purely to recognize the history of your home. I've helped a number of my neighbors get blue plaques. And, and you know, I think, you know, to go to the, the, the realty angle, that having a blue plaque on your house, I, I got to bet, adds value. Well, uh, once people learn, they can they can still really do what they want to do to their right. house. Yeah. It's, it, we're not like some of the historical towns where, you know. You, you have somebody chasing you for the color that you painted your house. You... But a lot of people think that when they see that, they think that it's somebody kind of getting their mitts in on your house and saying what you can and can't do. And that's, that's not true. That's, it's, it's just respecting the history of the property. If you want to, if you want help with the, with the blue plaque, let me know. <laughs> well, on that note, uh, we will sign off. How do people reach you? Are you going to be doing tours in the future? I had contemplated doing tours this year as things have gotten a bit better with the pandemic, but I did decide to hold off, especially because I figure there will be a lot of demand and I don't want a group of 100 people uh, trailing me around town. It would scare me and probably scare my neighbors too. Uh, you can find uh, my most recent project on the flood of 55 uh, on YouTube just by uh, okay. doing a search for uh, uh, Daniel Modell, Flood of 55. Okay. Um, and, uh, but yeah, anybody who wants to contact me with questions, my email is eastsidehistory at gmail.com. Okay. Uh, I love to help people research their properties and learn more about the, uh, the, the, the area. I do not charge anything. Uh, all of my work is free and that's important to me because I'm here to help everybody learn about our wonderful town. That is awesome. That's what I'm trying to do too. Well, I really, really super appreciate your time and uh, being patient with a technical aspect of it. Oh, it's and, fine. You did great. Well, thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm getting better at this. It does take practice. This is not something you could just jump on and do. I, I, how long has your mom been doing it, by the way? My mom has been doing her podcasts down in Orange County for, gosh, I'm not sure, maybe five or six years. But there's a lot of interest. I'm sure, you know, this is a great thing that you're, you're doing. I'm sure a lot of people appreciate it. Well, I got to get it up running. Always recommend me, the realtor lady. And uh, yeah, 